Hello, I'm Chris Richardson, and if you made it to part five, then you probably know by now that I'm an electronics engineer focused on power supplies. This is the fifth part in the series of web seminars for power supply enthusiasts or hobbyists who aren't necessarily trained as electronics engineers. So far, we've gathered some low-cost equipment to test power supplies, looked at unregulated power supplies, tested various linear regulators, and tested various switching regulators. In this session, we'll compare examples of these different power supplies and examine them to see which fits best in different applications. There are many, many different types of power supplies out there, from tiny systems using milliwatts or even microwatts in areas like the so-called energy harvesting field, to megawatts in electrical energy generation and distribution. Selecting the most appropriate device for your application is therefore a critical step in power supply use and design. Regardless of the type of power supply being tested, accurate power efficiency testing requires one ammeter and one voltmeter for the input to your supply, and then another ammeter and another voltmeter for each output. For very low power circuits, generally under one-tenth of a watt, special equipment is needed because the ammeter and voltmeter always consume some power and would distort those measurements. I'm going to focus on power supplies of at least one watt of output power, since that special equipment is definitely not on my list of affordable devices that I talked about in part one. Kelvin sensing refers to measuring the input voltage and output voltage directly at the inputs and outputs of your power supply. The demo boards I've been using always include test points right next to the input capacitors and also the output capacitors for this purpose. If you use the voltage readout of a lab power supply or trust the ATX silver box to give exactly 12 volts or 5 volts, your measurements will be wrong since voltage is lost to resistive drops in the connecting cables. The ammeter itself also uses a series resistor and some voltage is lost there too. For the first efficiency experiment, I'm going back to my unregulated power supply here. It's being used with a linear current source that's set to draw 500 milliamps. Here I'm measuring my input current. Here I'm measuring my input voltage. So we'll keep in mind it's drawing 30.8 milliamps at 226 volts RMS. Now I'll switch things around and we'll look at the output current and output voltage. Same circuit, but now when I turn it on, we're going to measure output current, 510 milliamps, and output voltage, 6.2 volts. Remember, this is a semi-regulated circuit. In practice, if we were going to calculate lots of efficiency points, we would vary the load. However, this linear current source is uh, actually logarithmic in the way that it adjusts with the potentiometer, so it makes it a little bit more difficult. Now I'm repeating the experiment, but instead of using the unregulated power supply, I have here the regulated switching power supply. This is the output voltage, output current and output voltage. So I want to go ahead and turn it on. Again, 510 milliamps. It's not actually as well regulated as I expected. It says 6.5 volts, and here we actually have 7 volts. Nonetheless, we can take these two data points and make an efficiency plot. Now I'm testing the input current and the input voltage to my switching AC to DC power supply. And we can already see that the input current is much lower, whereas the input voltage is almost exactly the same. So we know the efficiency is going to be much better. Now we have two more data points. Let's go ahead and calculate. In the previous slide and videos, we saw that switching regulators are vastly more efficient than linear regulators in most cases. So it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that linear regulators used in the same conditions of V in, V out, and I out dissipate a lot more power, and their components get a lot hotter than equivalent switching regulators. Still, the low electrical noise, simplicity, and low cost of NPN regulators and LDOs make them my preferred choice whenever it's reasonable to use them. Now, my criteria are the following. Number one, as long as V out is always lower than V in, and keep in mind your minimum input voltage. Two, as long as V out is not negative with respect to V in. Three, as long as V out does not require isolation from V in for safety or for noise reduction. And four, as long as the equation V in max minus V out multiplied times I out max is less than approximately one watt. This assumes that you don't have the space or the budget for a heat sink, and in my experience there is rarely space or money for heat sinks. It might be surprising to you, but many heat sinks that can dissipate more than one watt cost more than a power supply control chip. To talk about heat, I have here my synchronous buck converter. This is probably the most efficient of all the switching power converters, and it's delivering about 27 or 28 watts. I'm powering it from 12 volts from my ATX power supply here. I have almost exactly 5 volts as the output voltage, about 5.5 amps as the output current, and that's thanks to a, a group of power resistors here whose total resistance is just under 1 ohm. So to give an idea, 
right? The ambient temperature here in the room is somewhere between 27 and 28 degrees. So one of the power resistors is quite hot. It's going to be over probably close to 50 degrees C. I always think of that as you know, anything over 50 degrees C for me is uncomfortable to the touch. But if I come over here and start to measure the temperatures of some of the power components, this is the switching MOSFET. It generally is the MOSFET that gets the hottest, and it's barely over 30 degrees. Here's the synchronous power MOSFET, slightly cooler, 29 degrees and change. Here's the power inductor. This is also an element that can heat up a lot, barely over 30 degrees. Another thing we'll measure on aluminum electric, aluminum electrolytic input capacitor, barely heating up at all. So that means it should have a nice long lifetime. Now, if you watch the section on linear regulators, then you remember this discrete linear regulator. And I'm going to hold up the board just briefly so that you can see. It has a big, big heat sink, and it has a control chip, and then it has a discrete power resistor here. So we're going to compare this to the buck converter that I just did. Here we have the output current and the output voltage. So actually, the load here, which is altogether 1 ohm, is drawing so much power that it's actually collapsing the output voltage a little bit here. But this is still a good thermal test. Now the ambient temperature in here is about 27 degrees. So the only thing that really matters in a linear regulator is the chip itself, or in this case, the discrete pass element. So you'll see this kind of disappear behind here. But if I put the probe on there, we can see it's nice and hot. We have 86, 92, probably going to get to be over 100 degrees. So I have the tip of the thermocouple right at the junction of the heat sink and the power tab of that discrete power MOSFET. So there's a huge difference. Remember, none of the components in the buck regular were getting to be over maybe 31, 32 degrees or so. I'm going to go ahead and shut this off because it's overheating. Linear regulators beat switching regulators without any doubt when it comes to low conducted noise. That goes for their inputs, which we see at the top of the screen here, and those might be subject to legal limits, and for their outputs, which are often sensitive to noise. For example, most digital circuits are sensitive to noise of certain frequencies. Three ways to reduce voltage ripple when your power dissipation or voltage transformation force you to use a switcher are, number one, choose the topology of the switching regulator carefully. Recall that buck regulators are more noisy at their inputs than at their outputs, but boost regulators are the opposite. Inverting buck boost regulators and flyback regulators are noisy at both ends. It's a price you pay to be able to increase or decrease the output voltage. Number two, add a low pass output filter, usually a filter made up of an inductor and a capacitor. The filters are always low pass because you want pure DC and the noise is by its very nature AC. And three, Use a switching regulator to get very close, but just above your desired V-out, and then use an LDO as a so-called post-regulator. That minimizes the power dissipation in the LDO and makes the output voltage very smooth. To compare voltage ripple, I have both the buck regulator here on the left and my LDO with the discrete power transistor on the right. Each one is using 12 volts in from the ATX power supply. Each one has the same load, two 8 ohm resistors in parallel to make a total of a 4 ohm load. And on the previous slide, you saw the input voltage ripples. Now we're using the oscilloscope to measure the two output voltage ripples. Again, 5 volts output here, the LDO, 5 volts output for the buck. And if I look over here, the buck ripple is in yellow, the LDO ripple is in blue. Now at first you might say, they look almost the same. but Actually, most of the ripple that we see in blue is a result of noise coupling from the buck. And if we take out the probe, then we can see that the LDO noise is much, much lower. Linear regulators also radiate far less noise than a switching regulator, even a switcher that processes far less power. When I design switching power supplies, it usually takes me as long or longer to design the filters and electromagnetic noise reducing circuits as it does to design the switcher itself. If you know someone who has taken their product for UL testing in the United States or CE testing in Europe, then they probably have horror stories about spending days on frantic trial and error fixes for conducted or, more commonly, radiated noise that exceeded the limits. This is another reason why I use linear regulators whenever I can. All right, so to demonstrate electromagnetic interference, I have here an AM radio 
it's tuned to somewhere right around 600 kilohertz, and that's right in the range of the switching frequency of this buck regulator. And right now it's not on, and we can hear some lovely Spanish talk radio. I'm going to reach over here and actually turn on the circuit, and sure enough. And you can also see the closer I get the radio to the source, which is going to be the switching node here in the inductor, the more interference we hear. Once again, my radiated EMI test. Now I have AM radio, again tuned to around 600 kilohertz or so. And uh, we saw earlier with the buck that as soon as I turned it on, this became nothing but static. Well, here we have approximately the same amount of output power, but although there's a little bit of interference, we can basically hear even AM radio just fine, even if it's right in next close to the power supply. That's the beauty of linear regulators. Very little radiated noise. One more test here. I have the same radio, but now it's tuned to FM, 92 megahertz. Sounds good, even close in, but if I get the antenna close, then the interference starts to come in again. And this happens because not only does the switching converter operate at maybe 400 kilohertz to 1 megahertz, but it has a lot of harmonics and it also has high frequency noise. And those extend and they also interfere with the FM band. Alright, now we're going to test the linear regulator. I have here my FM radio. And uh, here's the antenna real close. I'm going to switch everything on. And I have to be quick because this gets really hot. But you can see drawing lots of current, voltage here. And no matter what I do, whoops, you continue to hear lots of Spanish radio. That concludes part five of Power Supplies for non double -E's. This is the last in the series for now, and it's been my pleasure making these videos. On behalf of myself and electronicstutorials.ws, I sincerely hope that you've learned something. Thanks again for watching.